attack me, does it? Okay. They won't. Okay. There we go. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I'm like a rising commercial to start things off with here today. So good to be with you. <clears throat> I've got a bit of a problem with allergies, so bear with me today. And uh, was here about four or five years ago to speak uh, about our school. The school's still, still going. And we start up a new uh, <clears throat> year in August of 12 of this year. We've got a couple of students. I've got one here talking to me about coming, so we hope and pray that you will. <clears throat> but that's not my purpose for being here today. That was just a quickie commercial. Now the long one's coming. <laughs> I just want to mention, I know you've heard about it, about our Faith Builders Workshop on the 4th of July weekend at PLU. That's Pacific Lutheran University. And uh, it's not the same as the Great Northwest Evangelism Workshop, a little bit different, but the time's the same and the place is the same. Our goal, perhaps is a little bit different than the Evangelism Workshop, our goal, of course, is to preach the Word of God, but our goal is to bring churches together and uh, to revitalize the churches in the Northwest. I've gone around and spoken to many uh, brothers, uh, preachers, elders, and we've all kind of, there's a consensus, kind of an agreement within the churches in this area that we've kind of let things slide. We've been kind of, you know, treading water a little bit here. Some of us might be below water just a little bit, okay? We want to get on top of the water. <laughs> and uh, because we're facing some trials and tribulations and temptations in our world today, we didn't face 20 years ago, not to the degree we are now. Uh, there's, a, there's an assault on Christianity in this world today, in this country today. And if we don't strengthen one another and build one another up, we're going to be, I think, food for the, those that want to destroy us. So that's one of the purposes. We have ten congregations here. Brother James Maxwell is one of our board members. Coming together now and uh, united on the, the goal of putting us together in a workshop, being built up together and, and rebuilding our fellowship. And so we're excited about that. It's come along quite well. And uh, I believe it's going to bless the church in the area. So I hope and pray. We're planning on keeping this Faith Builders Workshop around for a long time. So be praying for us. Put it down on your calendars and come and be a part of that. Some great speakers are lined up <clears throat> for that workshop. The title of my lesson today is The Power of Purpose. <clears throat> one of my favorite stories about a man who was driving down the road one day. He passed a traffic camera and saw it flash. Astounded that he had been caught speeding when he was doing the speed limit, the man turned around and going even slower passed the camera again. It flashed once more. He couldn't believe it. He turned, going a snail's pace, and passed the camera one more time. Again, he saw the camera flash. <clears throat> he guessed there must be a problem with the camera and went home. Four weeks later, he received three traffic fines in the mail. All of them were for not wearing a seatbelt. Life can be cruel. You gotta have focus, brothers and sisters. You gotta have focus. Satan will sneak up on you like a roaring lion. You all right. Open your Bibles to Numbers 11th chapter. We're going to talk about Moses this morning. <laughs> Moses lost focus. And it's amazing that he did because he'd had great victories. Defeating Pharaoh and his army going through the Red Sea. God was feeding them with manna from heaven and water out of rocks. And seemed like things were going quite well. But then one day we pick up the story, 11th chapter, verse 4. The rabble began to make noise. You don't have any rabble rousers in this congregation, do you? James doesn't allow that, does he? Okay. The rabble, when, <clears throat> verse 4, chapter 11, book of Numbers, the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. <clears throat> we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. No cost. I love that one. That's a profound statement. No cost. Cost. Just slavery. That's all. Just submit to being slaves. That's the only cost we had. 
for eating fish, okay? And then also cucumbers, melons, and leeks, and onions, and garlic. Boy, that's whetting my appetite already, isn't it? Wow. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it in a hand mill or crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into cakes. And it tasted like something made with olive oil. When the dew, dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. But Moses heard the people of every family wailing, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? Now listen to that for a moment. Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What did I do, Lord? <clears throat> What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their forefathers? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, giving me meat to give us, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, put me to death right now. If I have found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. Lord, I, I didn't sign up for this. Missed the memo somehow. That I'm supposed to carry these Jews on my back, or these Israelites on my back. I've got to nurse them like babies. He's getting tired of their waiting. He's getting tired of their complaining. He's getting tired of their always wanting more, you see. Do you suppose God gets tired of that once in a while? But did God ever give him the commission to carry these people on his back? Did God ever give him the commission to feed them all? Did God ever give him the commission and give him the command to take care of all their needs? I don't see them in Scripture. I went all through the book of Revelation, or Genesis and all through the book of Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus. I don't see it anywhere where God gave him the command to take care of them and all their needs. But see, something happened with Moses. He lost focus. Had everything going for him. Great victories. But all of a sudden, the victories went to his head. All of a sudden, the victories weren't coming from God, but from him. His dynamic personality, perhaps. His great leadership skills. Whatever it is, things are going well. As long as things are going well, he's giving credit to God. But down deep inside his heart, he's probably saying, God, aren't you lucky to have a servant like me? Ever said that? Ever thought that? Yeah. We have our moments, don't we? When we realize that, boy, I've been doing some good work. My ministry's going like hotcakes. God, aren't you glad you got me here? See, aren't you glad you're blessed? I'm, I'm your servant here doing great work, you see. There's a paradigm shift sometimes in men and women <clears throat> who lose sight of where the power is and lose focus on God's plan. Verse 18, tell the people, the Lord said, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. Does God have a sense of humor? Brother. I'd love to have been there to see that. Wow. So God's making a judgment, isn't he? Because you've rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him, saying, We did every why do we ever leave Egypt? Now you'd think that Moses would get the message. I mean, God's speaking pretty clear here, isn't he? He's upset with the rabble rousers. So you think Moses would get the message. But in verse 21, but Moses said, Here I am among 600,000 men on foot. And you say, I'll give them meat to eat for a, month, for a whole month? Did God say that Moses had to do that? No. You see, there, there's no commission for Moses to have to feed these people. But he's thinking, I've been carrying them on my back all this time. Now I'm getting tired of it. I didn't sign up for this much responsibility. And these many, this many headaches and all. I didn't sign up for this kind of stuff. And so he's saying, 
Verse 22, would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? What happened to the Red Sea? What happened to manna from heaven and water out of rocks? Did you miss that point? If, rocks and, if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them, would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? Then the Lord said in verse 23, Is the Lord's arm too short? Will you now see whether or not what I say will come true for you? And Moses wanted to die. He said, I've had enough. You ever been there? Have ever been there in your life, perhaps? Maybe not for the same reasons that Moses is expressing here. But have you ever been that way in your life? Things aren't going well. You've lost focus of God in your life, perhaps. You no longer seem to be spiritual in your mind and your heart and your motivations and, and your daily living. Now it seems like the things that motivate you are out there in the world. Somehow you lost focus. And you think that's where the joy is. That's where the power is. That's where the fulfillment is. That's where I'm going to meet my needs. And somehow God is second place on the back burner. But yet when you're out there in the world and you're working those things, you're working your thing out there in the world, but it's not happening for you. You're more frustrated, discouraged, depressed. And you're realizing more and more, somehow something went wrong somewhere along the road. And I lost focus. I want to talk about another great prophet. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. You'll remember this story. <clears throat> In chapter 18 of 1 Kings, Elijah won a great victory over the 450 prophets of Baal. Ahab was king of Israel at the time. Jezebel was his wife. Have you ever known any women named Jezebel today? <laughs> well, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. She was a sweetheart. And so he was, he was excited. I won't go into chapter 18 about it, but he was excited. I hope there's nobody named Jezebel in here. I'll be in trouble. But he was excited because he won a great victory. Slaughtered the 450 prophets of Baal. Things are going well. We're riding the tide here, man. Think, this is great. And then one day he wakes up and he didn't miss this memo because Jezebel says, I'm out to get your head. I've had enough of you, buddy. And notice what it says here, chapter 19, verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. If by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Verse 3. You know, this is one of the most amazing, I think, stories. Even more amazing to some degree than the one with Moses in chapter 11 of Numbers. Elijah was afraid. Now he's facing 450 prophets of Baal. He's fa facing Ahab, the king of Israel, and Jezebel. He's facing the world of his day and time. Declare in fact, he's mocking the 450 prophets of Baal. Giving him a hard time. Trash talk, you know. And so, and so he's having fun. I mean, things are going great. He expected from that point on to be in control of things and his destiny. He didn't expect some wife of the king to now say, I'm going to kill you. I've had enough of you. So he's thinking, have I failed? What did I do wrong? And notice in verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Sound kind of familiar? Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. I don't remember anywhere in the text, if you study 1 Kings chapter 1, to hear where God said, Hey, hey, you don't have to be better than your say. You have to be better than your ancestors. Now, the psychologist in me, you'll have to forgive me, but I have a tendency to analyze people's heads. I don't mean, that doesn't mean I can read their, mind, their thoughts, but sometimes I have a tendency to look at them as a psychologist and say, what's he thinking when he says? You see, what's defeating him now, the thought, the belief system that is encased in his subconscious mind that's defeating him right now is the belief that he's got to be better than his, his ancestors. I don't remember God giving him that command, do you? Or a memo. 
God never say, Elijah, you'll be successful as a prophet when you do a whole lot more and a lot better than your ancestors. That's all in Elijah's mind. It's not in God's. Somebody said a while back, I was listening to a preacher say that a while back, that we need to have vision today. As leaders, we need to have vision. But let's learn what vision is. Vision, I'm not talking about vision about your ministry so much, or vision about how much you can accomplish in the Lord's kingdom. I'm talking about a vision that is able to connect with God's vision for the church. That's a big difference, isn't there? You see, his vision was to do greater things than his ancestors had done. Greater things than Moses, you see. Greater things than his ancestors. So he's thinking, boy, if I can just do that, I'll have accomplished great things. I'll feel good about myself. As a psychologist, I'm convinced one of the strongest drives in human nature is to feel significant. One of the strongest drives we have keeps me in business as a counselor. They all come to me when they don't feel significant, see? But that's a strong drive. Nothing wrong with it. It's just how we want to accomplish feeling significant. And as Christians, how do you want to accomplish feeling significant? I'll tell you how. Being a servant to God's will and His vision. You see? That's the, that's the whole thought here. Being a servant of God's will. Now, you can look at your own lives. What is your vision? What are your aspirations? What are your dreams? What do you want to do in your life? What do you want to do for the Lord? Is it tied in with God's vision of what His church ought to be and His kingdom ought to be today? Or is it simply tied into your own aspirations <clears throat> that will glorify you, make you feel significant? Nothing wrong with feeling significant. But we've got to get a proper focus, folks, as to what's making us feel significant. Then go to Mark chapter 9. <coughs> Excuse me, but the old allergies are still there. <coughs> Mark chapter 9. <coughs> now, in this story, the disciples had been sent out. The apostles had been sent out to heal the sick and raise the, or whatever, you know, cast out the demons and all that. They were given power by God, by Jesus, to do that. And Jesus had already fed the 5,000. So now they're coming back. And some of the disciples are arguing with some of the people. Let's pick up at verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever he seizes, it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to give out to drive out the spirit but they could not oh unbelieving generation Jesus replied how long shall I stay with you how long shall I put up with you bring the boy to me so they brought him when the spirit saw Jesus it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion he fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth Jesus asked the boy's father how long has he been like this from childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can't do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, that's a question, by the way. Jesus is challenging him, if you can. In other words, what do you mean by that? Don't you know what I can do? You've already seen some miracles. You know I can. But I love his answer. Jesus said everything's possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Most of us are probably there, aren't we? You know, we get excited about the Lord and about His work in our lives and the Holy Spirit in our lives. And like James said in James 1, 5 through 8, if you ask for wisdom, nothing, else, nothing doubting, and you shall receive. So we get on our knees and ask God, give me wisdom. i got a problem I'm struggling with. Maybe a wife or a husband I'm struggling with or whatever, whatever kind of problem it might be. And it's causing me distress and anger and all of that. Please help me, Lord. I'm on my knees. I'm praying to you. I have faith that you will help me. Then we get up from our knees and going about solving the problem ourselves. Yeah. Ever been there? Ever been there? James says, don't expect God to give you anything, not just an answer to that prayer and for wisdom, but anything because you're a double-minded man, unstable in all your ways. True faith means when I turn it over to God, I leave it with God. 
I don't go back to my unbelief. And that's what this man is talking about. And he's not even a true believer yet. But he has a belief level perhaps where most of us are. Verse 25. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? I want you to take note of that statement. He replied, this kind can, can come out only by prayer. You know, for a long time as I studied that text, I kept wondering, what does that really mean? And again, the psychologist didn't mean it came to the conclusion, I'll bet these guys, when they're out there casting out demons and healing people, they're having a ball, you know? Kind of like Elijah did at Mount Carmel. And they're thinking, isn't this great? We have the power of the Holy Spirit at our fingertips. People are praising us and following us, and we're being glorified by this. It's such good fun, isn't it? We're enjoying it. We feel significant now. But you know, there was a paradigm shift somewhere where they lost sight of where the power was, where it was coming from. And Satan knows when you make a shift in your faith. He picks up on it. He's picking up on these disciples. He's seeing them thinking, now it's me instead of God. I've got the power. I've got the glory. Isn't this great? I'm glad I've signed up to be an apostle. I never expected this much fun. And Satan thinking, aha. Aha. And now, this demon was not your average run-of-the-mill kind of demon, see. Now, demons are pretty smart, too. We see that in Scripture, don't we? He was smart enough to know Jesus had the power. To... But, but he's thinking. He's a tough one. He's a little bit tougher than most of them, see. So it came across him. Now, he's thinking, under the guidance of Satan, these guys are fooling themselves. They've now thought that the power has transformed from God and the Holy Spirit to them. And they know they picked up on that. And so the demons think, aha, uh-huh, they don't have the power. I know Jesus. I know the power he has because he just experienced it, didn't he, when he was cast out of this poor boy. But that same spirit in his own mind, through Satan's influence, undoubtedly is thinking, ah, but these disciples have lost sight of where the power is. And once they do that, Satan knows that in your life. You know that? He does. He knew it right here. Right here he knew the disciples had had a paradigm shift in their thinking. Now they're thinking they have the power, they have the authority. They're to be glorified, and they lost their power. And they could not cast this demon out. And Jesus is saying, you should have gotten on your knees and prayed to God to have the power again to do it. You should have recognized where the power came from. Boy, can we learn a lesson from that today. As we face this world and we think many times the power's out in the world rather than in Jesus Christ, rather than in Jesus Christ, and sometimes we look to the powers of the world to give us and to save us, Instead of the power of God through the Holy Spirit. There was an interesting story that I read a while back. It was in the book called Kingdoms in Conflict. Charles Colson wrote the book. He's written some very good stuff. And in that book, he said, People cannot live without meaning. Where there is no meaning, there is no power. We don't have to look very far to see the phenomenon at work. He goes on to say, During World War II, a group imprisoned at a Nazi concentration camp in Hungary converted waste products into synthetic alcohol to be used as a fuel additive. One day, the Allies bombed the camp and almost destroyed the building where the alcohol was manufactured. The next morning, the guards decided to punish the inmates. They forced them to take all the rubble from the air raid raid and arrange it at one end of the field. When the prisoners finished this task, the guards ordered them to carry it back to the other end. This went on back and forth for several weeks until the prisoners began to break under the strain. Some tried to escape and were killed. 
Others electrocuted themselves by jumping on the high, high voltage fence that surrounded the camp. A few lost their minds because the work made no sense. Their lives had no meaning. We must have meaning in life. We must have a reason for being. Where there is no purpose, there is no power. Tragic story, isn't it? But it's so true in our lives. When there's no meaning, those purpose, there's no purpose. God somehow instilled in us psychologically, emotionally, spiritually that we have to have meaning in life. We can go about living a sinful life all we want to. We go about doing all the things in the world we want to do. But somehow if there's no meaning, and there is no meaning out in the world, that's worth giving your life to. There is no meaning out in the world that's worth having all the wealth of the world. There's no meaning out in the world that can give you all the significance maybe you want temporarily, shortly. There's only meaning in Jesus Christ. And one day, an apostle, with all his mistakes and goof-ups, all the times he opened his mouth when he shouldn't have, it dawned on him. John 6, turn your Bibles there. It dawned on him. Jesus was preaching to a great crowd that day. He would fed the 5,000. More than that, because children and wives and mothers were not mentioned in this account. And so after he preached, or excuse me, after he fed the 5,000, then he thought, this is a good time to preach. He's got listeners. He's got people that are really tuned in to him. Then he goes about preaching about how you've got to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood to be saved. I get to see those disciples sitting back there, the apostles. Whoa, what's he doing here? He's messing up. A good candidate does not say things like that, right? I mean, he's in a campaign now to be king. He's going to win these people over. This is not a good campaign strategy, you know? This is a mess up like maybe a Joe, no, I won't say Joe Biden, but anyway, this is a mess up like some people might... And they're probably thinking, why is he going there? Remember back in Matthew, the 13th chapter, when he started to speak in parables? And the disciples are questioning, why are you doing that? People can't understand what you're trying to say. You have to have a clear message for your audience to respond. If they're going to elect you king. And you can just see in their minds thinking, whoa, man, has he blown it now? There's no hope. All the people left but the 12. All of them. That would devastate any preacher. If James came, James came up here next Sunday, he's a great preacher, it won't happen, I know, but if he were to come up here next Sunday and his, class, his audience start out singing, all of a sudden they'll turn around and walk out the building. Yeah. He'd be like their Jer Elijah probably. Lord, take me. It's not worth going on any longer. But anyway, let's, let's pick it up in verse 60. And hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. <clears throat> for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him? He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer <clears throat> followed him. You see, Jesus, back when you remember in Matthew 13, he's talking about the parables. He makes the point. I don't just want bodies out there following me. I don't just want attendance at the church building on Sunday morning. I just don't want people following me because I can perform miracles or feed them or do things that are spectacular and they see a show every time they come across me. I don't want people following me just for that reason. I want them to be committed to me, to giving their life to me. And when I say things that they can't quite understand, to have the poise and the belief and the patience and the commitment and the trust to work it out and find out what the truth is. 
So now he's looking at his disciples, the 12. And he has, to me, one of the most saddest, perhaps, one of the saddest questions. I'm trying to pick up the emotion of what he's going through. He's a man too, isn't he? He's a son of God, but he's a man. He is God, he is deity, but he's human. He lost his audience. He's looking at his disciples. This is not a question he's just asking them just to be cute. He's really concerned. And he's putting them to the test. And the emotion that he has here, the sadness, the frustration. You do not want to leave too, do you? Just look at that. It's equal to, I think, when he wept because Lazarus was in a tomb dead, his friend. Maybe it's kind of equal to the time he said, Lord, why have you forsaken me on the cross? His humanity comes out here. He's sincere about this question. He's testing them. I think he probably knows they're not going to leave it, but he's testing them. He's sincere about it. And then Simon Peter said, smartest, one of the smartest things he said before the cross. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. I imagine Peter, there's probably some thoughts that flashed through his mind about this time. I wonder if he's thinking, what are my options here? Is worldliness, worldliness an option? With its hopelessness, self-destructive philosophy, with no hope? No peace, no security in worldliness. How about heathenism with its cruelty? With its lack of focus on the needs of people? How about Judaism? Ah, oh, there's an option. Been there, done that. With its hypocrisy and legalism, no hope there. No purpose there. No reason for committing my life there. What about John the Baptist? Could I go back to John the Baptist? No, he'll just point you back to Jesus again. <laughs> Can't win that one. You know, we're in a world today when there's so many people out there screaming, I've got the right religion. But yet Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. No one who's committed to the Muslim religion. No Pope. Nobody's committed Hinduism or Buddhism or any other ism. Will not find a pathway to Jesus or to the Lord. Some are saying out there, well, there are many pathways, many ways to get there. That's not what my Lord said. There's only one. And Peter is thinking about his options here. And he says, yeah, there's only one. I know you're the one because you have the words of eternal life. Maybe I've messed up and put my number 10 foot in my mouth a few times. But I know you're the only one. You have the words of eternal life. And I'm going to stick with you. Now, he does it. We know he denies him three times and all that. But even Jesus knew he would repent. Because he said, when you come back to the Lord, feed the sheep. Where are you today? Are you at a point now where you've lost focus? Are you at a point today where you're thinking about another option? Oh, the world is so enticing today, isn't it? The music of the world, much of it corrupt, ungodly, and crude, is enticing to a lot of young people. The wealth of the world is enticing to a lot of people. Maybe even the other religions that seem to be more exciting, you see, and seem to give you that you know, warm feeling. Jesus didn't give them a warm feeling in John 6. Okay? They didn't walk out of the sermon with a warm fuzzy. How many times, I know James has heard this and I've heard it, have people say, well, the sermon just, you know, the worship service, ah, it just didn't meet my needs. Peter's thinking about what meets his needs. And that moment he had focus. He focused on purpose. He realized the only purpose in life was to follow and give your life for the one who has the words of eternal life. Amen. I'm telling you folks today, our churches are struggling with focus. 
And maybe you are today, this very hour. Maybe you're thinking about your options. Let me tell you something, you don't have any. You don't have any. The glitter, the fun, the desires and all that stuff that's out there, that's not really an option. Too many people have destroyed their lives taking that option. I've worked with too many families that have been messed up and destroyed taking that option. As enticing as it may be, only Jesus. If you haven't seen that in your life, if you haven't proven it in your life, you need some work in the Word of God. Because that's it. That's it. He's coming again. And when He comes again, everybody, notice that in Philippians 2, not just the believers, not just the faithful, everybody will bow down and claim Him, Lord Jesus. You're in control. And my destiny is in your hands. Where are you today? Where's your focus? What's your purpose? If you need to get it right with God this hour, this moment, this is the time. Satan knows where you are. He knows what you're thinking. He knows where you are trying to go, thinking it's better out there in the world. Focus. This is the moment. This is the moment when you tell Satan, tell the world, I don't need you. I need Jesus. And if you do that this hour, and you want him and you need him, won't you come while we stand and sing?